How do we know if an image is real? You've probably seen this video circulating online. It shows a fitness instructor live streaming a workout routine in Yepitao, the capital city of Myanmar, while in the background, unknown to her, a military coup is taking place. This video went viral on social media and it brought the situation in Myanmar to the attention of the world. But almost as soon as it started circulating internationally, some people started questioning whether or not the video is real. Twitter users have tried to verify the location it was shot in, and some have floated the theory that it was shot on a green screen. This is unsurprising, because in the age of deepfakes, the internet will question the authenticity of any video with political consequence. With the proliferation of Photoshop, airbrushing, image manipulation, deepfakes, computer-generated images, it feels as though we live in a world where we can no longer trust any of the images that we see. But what if I told you that this wasn't a new thing? that people have been mistrusting images for centuries. In order to understand why, we must first understand what makes us trust an image, what makes us believe what it is telling us. In this video essay, I'm exploring our relationship between images and reality. And I'm gonna ask a question that we may not often think about. What makes an authentic image? Here's another image that you might be familiar with. This series of photographs taken in California in 1878 by Edward Muybridge are among some of the most famous photographs ever taken. They're famous because when played in quick succession, one after the other, they became the first moving image. The first movie. Most comprehensive histories of film and cinema will trace the medium's origin back to this sequence. But when these photos were first taken, they were never intended to create a moving image at all. In fact, the original intention for these images was the exact opposite. It was to freeze time. Here's how the story goes. It's 1873. Leland Stanford, governor of California and founder of Stanford University, has a bet with a friend over whether a galloping horse ever has all four of its legs off the ground at the same time. This theory is called unsupported transit. And to prove his theory, Stanford commissions photographer Edward Moybridge to capture the moment that all four of the horse's legs leave the ground, a moment too brief for the human eye to see, in a photograph. Under Stanford's patronage, Moybridge produces several images that are published in the French journal La Nature in 1878, to much acclaim and much criticism. You see, many people just didn't believe that these photos were real. The snapshot moments with the horse's legs curled up underneath its body looked ridiculous to them. We have to remember that this is a society pre-high-speed photography, where most photographs required long exposure times and very, very still subjects. Today, images like this are commonplace, but in the 19th century, this had never been seen before. What's more, Western visual culture already had a well-established convention of representing horses in motion, and it did not look like this. Artists' interpretations of horses at a gallop were often seen in paintings showing hunt scenes or horse racing. In these paintings, it was the convention to show the horse with both sets of legs outstretched, as if leaping through the air. And you can't blame them. When horses run, their legs move so fast that to the naked eye, their legs do appear to extend in front and behind like they do in these paintings. To a photographic society like ours, these paintings look kind of silly, more like something a child would draw than anything realistic. But to the 19th century viewer, these paintings represented their visual experience. So when some people first saw Moybridge's photographs of the horse with its legs curled under its body, they said it was optically incorrect. Il est certain qu'il ne voit et qu'il ne verra jamais le cheval au galop comme on le lui montre dans ses dessins. In order to prove his photographs were real, Moybridge set about creating a device he called the Zoopraxiscope, which was essentially a projector which would play his photographs on a spinning disc giving the illusion of movement. It's important to note that Moybridge's zoopraxiscope was not the first device of this kind. People had been making phenakistoscopes since the 1830s, mostly with hand-drawn illustrations. Once people saw the frames running together and recognized the movement that they saw as true to reality, Moybridge's photographs got the stamp of approval. From this moment onwards, our culture's standards for representing reality shifted slightly. As short exposures and high-speed photography became more and more commonplace, people became more accustomed to images that would have been unimaginable before. 
And not only do these photographs represent a shift in what counted as believable representation, they also created a whole new set of expectations for representing reality and what types of images counted as evidential proof. To understand what a monumental shift this was in visual culture, we only have to jump back five years before these photos were published, to 1873. Stanford and Moybridge's project actually started years before the famous 1878 photographs were published and their first attempts were far less refined. Photographing a horse at speed was a very difficult task because it required a very fast shutter speed. And at this point in time, most photographers were producing exposures by manually removing the lens cap and replacing it after several seconds. The Alta California newspaper reported on the 7th of April, 1873, that after two days of failed attempts trying to capture an image of the horse, Mr. Mybridge, having studied the matter thoroughly, contrived to have two boards slip past each other by touching a spring, and in doing so leave an eighth of an inch opening for the 500th part of a second as the horse passed, and secured a negative that shows oxidant in full motion, a perfect likeness of the celebrated horse. Now, Moybridge spent years perfecting this tripwire activated camera shutter method. He collected all the sheets from the surrounding neighborhood to create a white background and eventually had 12 cameras set up, each with their own individual tripwires, to catch the horse at different stages of its movement. But the first photograph that Moybridge was able to capture was so blurry that it was deemed unpublishable. And sadly, this photograph is now lost. But Stanford still wanted to announce publicly that he had proven his theory of unsupported transit. So he had an artist create an image based off the blurry photograph. This is the image that was widely circulated that year. It's fairly obvious that the position of the horse's legs in this picture don't match any of the frames Moybridge captured. This illustration is far more in line with the tradition of horse paintings than it is with any of the photographs Moybridge took. Now today, this might seem like an unscientific, unfaithful artist's interpretation, but in 1873, this type of image still counted as proof. And as we know from people's reaction to the 1878 photographs, an artist's image with the horse's legs in a more accurate position would probably have also been dismissed and ridiculed. Today in our society where high-speed photography is commonplace, illustrations are kept to the cartoon section of the newspaper. So it may be hard for us to imagine believing an artist's illustration over a photographic image made by a machine. And this is because standards for reality are directly related to the visual technological conventions of an era. That is to say, the types of images we make influence what we think reality looks like. The people who looked at this image and were suspicious of its authenticity were looking at this visual evidence with the same type of skepticism as Moybridge's critics were looking at his horse photographs, albeit from different sides of the table. Moybridge's critics disbelieved these pictures because they were faced with a new type of image they had never seen before, facilitated by a technology that had yet to proliferate in our society. The amateur sleuths on Twitter disbelieved this video because they were acutely aware of the technological capabilities today to fake an image like this. In both cases, though, the images were not fake. But both of these examples demonstrate how our visual conventions and technological capabilities influence our readiness to believe in images that we see. I think it's safe to say that a huge shift took place in the 1870s in what counted as a believable, truthful image. Going from this to this in such a short space of time was a big change for Western visual culture. And it wasn't the first time. Similar shifts occurred with the rise of linear perspective in Renaissance art, which made optical rendering of a 3D space the new gold standard for artistic production. The invention of the telescope and the microscope created whole new categories of previously unimaginable scientific images. Or even more recently, the first ever images of Earth taken from space which for anyone born after the moon landing, we take for granted, but they radically reshaped how we visualize and imagine our planet. Just like Moybridge's horse, all of these examples go to show that it's nearly impossible to imagine a new way of seeing until we see it 